Bridget Landon, Director of the Department of Libraries and Museums. And we are excited, first of all, look around. It's raining outside. I'm sure there are plenty of people who thought that folks wouldn't be here. But you guys are here, so thank you for coming. So we're excited, and I would say for me, on behalf of the Greensboro Public Library, the Greensboro Public Library Foundation, we are excited to have you all here. We are also excited that we understand that when museums and parks work together, we can provide great programs for the community. This is probably just one, since Aaron's here now, of many that we'll be doing together because we realize, because we can see from now on those who are probably joining us live, that there's a need for us to work together to provide information to community. So tonight, I hope you're ready. Get ready, get ready to hear some things that you probably hadn't heard before. Get prepared to get some questions to ask at the end. Again, thank you for being here, and I'm going to turn it over to Aaron Loraka. Thanks for that introduction. On behalf of the park staff, welcome to Gopher Courthouse National Military Park. My name is Aaron Larock, and I'm lucky enough to be the superintendent here. For those who don't know, today is the sixth day of National Park Week. It's a nine day long celebration. I don't know where we got nine days for National Park Week, but that's okay. It's a nine day long celebration of all things parks. Um, every year, the National Park Service creates a new theme for to help us celebrate National Park Week. It brings together parks, it brings together over the 400 parks across the country. It brings together the 22,000 park employees, the over 125,000 park volunteers, the 30 million, excuse me, 300 million park visitors, and our countless partners. And before I continue with the theme for this evening's event, speaking of partners, I'd like to introduce Ed Deaton, who is the board chair of our nonprofit partner, Guilford, Courthouse, uh, sorry, GBC, Guilford Battleground Company. Ed. Good evening. I really appreciate you all turning out on this really rainy and cold, cold evening. The Guilford Battleground Company, we are the park partner with, with, with their chief fundraiser, with their chief cheering section. Our job is to do really three things. We preserve, protect, and promote the park. We promote it through lecture series like these and others, through supporting the annual battle reenactment through all sorts of initiatives. We act when there's zoning issues, we get involved in that. We have actually sponsored ranger positions. We've sponsored archaeological digs here. We do all sorts of things. Basically, as like the company, when we do anything here, it needs done, do it. We try to help it do that. We don't, we don't create the programs, but we support the programs. We have a Patriot organization that supports us through giving. If you're interested in that, I have some brochures. You can catch me after that after the lecture is over, which I'm really excited to hear. I can tell you more about the Battleground Company or how you can participate. And once again, thank you all for coming. So the National Park Service creates themes for National Park Week. The most famous theme that we've ever created or slogan for National Park Week dates back to 2016 and it's Find Your Park. 2016 was the centennial of the National Park Service that's probably the theme you're most familiar with. But National Park Week, all of them have different themes. Last year was Spark a Connection. This year's theme is hashtag your, your park story. My highest hope for this event this evening is that this program becomes part of hashtag your park story. As previous speakers have pointed out, I think this is the first in a long program, a long series of programs, and a long partnership to help us elevate these important stories. So let's get to it. Our first speaker this evening is Scott Poplazier, uh, who has literally written the book about the park. And he's going to be offering an overview of the battle and the site's history and significance as a national park. Scott. Good evening. Good evening. <laughs> The Battle of Guilford Courthouse, fought on the afternoon of March 15, 1781, was one of the longest, bloodiest, and most significant engagements of the American Revolutionary War, and one that did not even involve George Washington. Instead, the battle was the culminating fight of the Southern Campaign of 1780-81, a last-ditch British effort to reclaim control of the Southern states. The campaign began promisingly for the British 
with the capture of Charleston and the surrender of an American army in May 1780. From there, a second American force <coughs> excuse me, was passed in Camden in August. Without hesitation, Washington dispatched a new commander to the South, Major General Nathaniel Green, his most trusted field commander. When Green arrived in Charlotte in December, he was dismayed by the pitiful condition of his army and the destruction of countryside rent by partisan warfare. Green's initial concern was to avoid battle with the British, led by the capable Lord Charles Earl Cornwallis. And so he embarked on a masterful retreat across the state, crossing rain-swollen rivers just ahead of the British pursuit. Pausing at the backcountry hamlet of Guilford Courthouse in February, Green decided to further postpone battle, withdrawing instead the safe haven in Virginia, his army fording the Dan River only hours before the British reached his location. Once there, the American force was bolstered with new levies of both Virginia Continental and militia troops. Now in command of nearly 5,000 men, and knowing that many of his militia enlistments would soon expire, Green realized that the time had come to, con to contest Cornwallis's claim to have subdued North Carolina. He returned to Guilford Courthouse, this time looking for a fight. Cornwallis was eager to oblige, leading an army numbering just shy of 2,000 soldiers, all of them hardened by war. Sharp skirmishing on the morning of March 15th alerted Green that battle was at hand and led to a crucial decision. He would let, allow the British to attack. Although his army outnumbered his opponents by more than two to one, Green did not trust largely untrained and untested militia from North Carolina and Virginia to withstand a spirited attack by British troops skilled in the use of the bayonet. And so he placed militias to the front, hoping simply to allow the British on to slow the British onslaught before they reached the Continentals. A thousand North Carolinians were positioned in a line that straddled New Garden Road the center looking across open fields, these men would be the first to see British soldiers. In the early afternoon, after a 30-minute exchange of cannon fire, the British launched their assault. Green ordered the militia to fire twice at close range, figuring they could not stand for long. And that seems to be what happened, with the British sustaining significant losses as a first volley opened gaps in their ranks. The militia line then crumbled. Entering dense woods, the British pushed eastward where they encountered a second American line. Like the first, it was composed of militia, this time from Virginia. The sounds of gunfire reverberating through smoky, dense undergrowth added to the growing chaos of battle. As the Virginians gave ground, the British lost much of their momentum. British regiments increasingly disjointed from each other, pressed on to the vicinity of the courthouse, where Green had placed the majority of his continental. <coughs> Fighting at this third and final American line seesaw, new recruits from Maryland broke ranks, threatening the, line, the line's collapse, charging American cavalry, and a fierce counterattack by veteran Maryland and Delaware soldiers intensified the combat. When British cannon fire drove off the dragoons, Green decided to disengage, sensing that he had inflicted a devastating blow and unwilling to further risk the destruction of his army. Green's troops withdrew from the field, relieved that the British were too exhausted to pursue. Cornwallis had little to savor in his victory. He could congratulate his soldiers for their discipline, but as his men remained on the field, the enormous cost his army paid became painfully evident. While American casualties were significant, they were not crippling. For the British, however, the blow amounted to a stunning defeat. No longer able of pursuing Green's army, Cornwallis moved to Wilmington. Far away, London understood what he had left unsaid. Lord Cornwallis, Horace Walpole observed, has conquered his troops out of shoes and provisions and himself out of troops. Green offered his own succinct view of the campaign. We fight, get beat, rise, and fight again. 
The battlefield lay neglected and nearly forgotten until Judge David Shank organized the Guilford Battleground Company and began to purchase land for a small part. During the company's heydays, the 1890s into the early years of the last century, the park became the place for July 4th celebrations that often included the unveiling of a new monument. For our gathering this evening, the No North, No South monument is especially revealing. Dedicated in 1903, this granite block bears a simple inscription, No North, Washington, on its east face, and on the west side, No South, Green, referring to the simple fact that Washington, the Virginia, won fame in the northern theater of war, while Green, a Rhode Islander, is best remembered for the southern campaign. Here, context is important. By the beginning of the 20th century, the bitter sectionalism of the Civil War years had faded, with park celebrations likely to include brass bands playing both Dixie and the Star Spangled Banner. Reconciliation between North and South depended upon a narrative that excluded any reference to black participation in the revolution. Established in 1917, Guilford Courthouse National Military Park has been administered by the National Park Service since 1933. During these years, the park has undergone many changes, most notably by returning the field from a manicured appearance that was described as resembling a suburban cemetery to one closer to the backcountry landscape of 1781. More recently, stories of black participation in the battle are being recovered, bearing witness that these men, militia and continental, enslaved and free, could be found in every scene of the action. This evening, we are introduced to a new story, that of an enslaved man named Ishmael Titus, who at the time of his death in 1855, was one of the very last surviving veterans of the Battle of Guilford Courthouse. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Yes. All right, my name is Rodney Dawson. I'm with the North Carolina African American Heritage Commission, which is a part of the North Carolina Department of Natural and Cultural Resources. How many ever heard of it? Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Our job is to preserve, protect, and promote uh, African American heritage, uh, more specifically as it relates more germane to our state of North Carolina. And that's covering education, history, arts, culture. So we love being a part of events that do that work for us. So I'm here to acknowledge and thank the committee uh, for their time and for uh, their efforts in putting this together. Because uh, oftentimes, as we know, a lot of this history can be marginalized, so we have to take steps uh, to bring it to light. So we thank them for that. Um, and two people I want to thank in particular. Uh, everybody did a great job. I didn't do as much as they did. I'll take that. <laughs> but um, two people in particular. One is Beth Sheffield uh, with the Greensboro Public Library. Can we pause for a round of applause? Yes, we do. Before this job, I worked with the Greensboro History Museum, which is where I was able to uh, collaborate and link up with Beth. And one thing, I have a passion and a gift for connecting people. Uh, Beth has a passion and a gift for celebrating people. And uh, she's relentless about it. And uh, she will push a program, and she'll prove you wrong. So I thank you for uh, the continuous and ongoing efforts uh, to tell underrepresented students. So thank you for that. Secondly, uh, I want to thank a um, young lady that I met back in what, 2019 when I was at the Greensboro History Museum and she called me and she said, I want to share my story with you. And she said, my name is Joanna Winston Fogel. And I'm like, that's great. And um, <laughs> she said the Winston comes from the, the city of Winston-Salem. My uh, uh, great, 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 I don't know how many times I need to go back. Great, great, great grandfather is uh, uh, Winston name, uh, Nathaniel Winston? Joseph. Joseph Winston, wow. and whom the city is named after, and uh, mm -hmm. he enslaved folks. And I want to make that right. Mm -hmm. And she says, I found that uh, going around, um, not necessarily taking monuments down, but the story that I found is that there's some monuments that are missing, mm -hmm. and those are the black patriots that fall. Mm -hmm. 
African Americans fought in every major conflict this country has had, mm -hmm. and that includes the uh, American Revolution. Mm -hmm. And she's uh, been relentless, like uh, Belle, on pushing that story. So a few years ago, we had a, uh, a webinar, and we worked with folks from across the country, including an author named uh, John Reach, and he picked up his book. He's written extensively on this subject. Uh, what's uh, Mr. Freeman's first name? Uh, Trevor. He's Trevor Freeman with the Western North Carolina Historical Association. Uh, he's written extensively about it. He was a part of it. You're going to hear from Professor Hooker tonight who participated. And then we also heard from the Monument Lab out of Philadelphia. And so if you go on the Greensboro History Museum website, you can have that conversation. But she didn't stop there. She kept pushing. I thought it was over. <laughs> and he turned it into a podcast that was narrated by a wonderful student out of North Carolina State named Alondia Warren who just took it over. I didn't tell her this, but I went from training her to learning from her. But she took it to a different level and showed the representation that is missing from so many different Democrats. And so if you check out that podcast, you're going to hear from people, uh, young white female, young Asian female, heterosexual, everybody talk about representation. Ed Dwight, a renowned uh, sculptor who's uh, had sculptures all across this country. Solomon, you're in, did you know that? Um, everybody's in. And so go to the History Museum, check out that podcast. It's called Minding Our Minds. But if it weren't for uh, those two, particularly Joanna, I don't think it'd be here. So let's clap for her. Too. Um, so it's very, I'm very happy to be here. I think it's going to be a wonderful program. I'm going to kick it off with my former boss, Ms. Carol Hart. She's the uh, director of the Greensboro History Museum. And she will serve as our moderator for tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Robbie. So while our panelists are going on the stage, I'll do a brief introduction so we know who everybody is. Ernest Hooker, here, an instructor at North Carolina A&T State University. He's been teaching African American history and military history for nearly a decade. He served in the uh, United States Army for four years, through the Gulf War. Uh, then we have Sage Chama, is a descendant of Ishmael Titus, who fought several Revolution War battles. We're going to hear a lot more about that. She's an addiction and substance abuse counselor in Greensboro, among many other things. And then Solomon Titus Taylor is a descendant of, also of Ishmael Titus and has conducted extensive research on his family's ancestry. He's from Rochester, New York. He came all the way today to be with us. Uh, he served in the US Marine Corps for about 16 and a half years and an active duty in the seven years uh, in the reserves. Uh, and then he returned to Rochester as a Marine recruiter. So we are really happy to have you here with us tonight. I'm excited. We heard some of the context of the Revolutionary War, the bigger picture, the battles from Scott. But now we're going to get personal, and really not only the personal stories of, of one of the black patriots, but your personal stories. And I'd I like to start, if you could each just take a minute, because you're, you are all doing the work of history in very different ways, different kinds of things. It sounds a little bit almost like that detective story, there's a lot of mysteries, investigation. So what did history mean to you before you started this journey to discover the story of African-American Revolutionary War soldiers? And what does it mean to you now, idea of history? Do you want to start? <coughs> well, good, good evening. Good evening. Uh, well, for me, uh, I grew up in a military family, uh, my dad, Served in Vietnam. Uh, I found out maybe about 10 years ago that my grandfather was a pilot uh, during the Korean War. And so, uh, fast forward, uh, served in the military, went to the Gulf War. I got out, and I really didn't want anything to do with military history. <laughs> and so, I found myself uh, enrolling at North Carolina ENT to make an interesting story. Me and my wife, we moved up here. And I had about two weeks to get enrolled in school. I went to UNCG first. And they said, well, we're only going to give you 30 hours. I said, well, I got an associate's degree. Came to A&T, uh, got enrolled. Then I get to my department, and I found out my department chair is a vet who fought in Vietnam 
in a chemical core. And so from there, I started doing some research on the Buffalo Soldiers. And my experience was that I was asked to speak at Rockingham Community College. Uh, most of the professors at the time weren't available. And so I was kind of, I was kind of nervous. Like, you know, what do I say? You know, what type of choice of words I use? And the instructor at the time, just tell the story as it is and be passionate about it. And remember, you're informing. So started talking about the Buffalo Soldiers and I, it turned out to be excellent. I found out all the contributions that they made for building up the Western Frontier. And then I found out about African Americans who served in the Russian Revolutionary War. And so I took charge to make history more public, more, uh, for me, it's more social uh, to get to learn, learn the person and what they contributed when it came to African American, as Mr. Dawson mentioned, from the American Revolution, the Civil War, World War II. That is one area that blacks had a voice, including including women. So to sum this up, I started doing uh, speaking engagements. Now I do military exhibits uh, for plays all over Greensboro, outside of Greensboro. And for history, to me, it's like shoots and ladders. If you want to talk about uh, Caribbean culture, we can talk about, you want to talk about uh, World War II and Hitler, or you want to talk about uh, you know, Japan, history to me is like shoots and ladders. You go up one, you go down another, and you make history uh, relevant. You know, you make it, you tell a story, that's what, um, so I would say for me, uh, that's the intriguing part of history, it's just like shoots and ladders. You go from the 1940s, you go to the 1920s, and you go all the way to the 1960s, and you go all the way back down to where we are today, 1776. <laughs> Why did I know she was going to do that? Uh, history for me, um, I guess you would say I am history. Uh, born in 1960, uh, during some turbulent times, uh, in fact the day of my birth, uh, July 15th, 1960, was the day that John F. Kennedy announced his uh, presidency, that he was going to run for presidency. And then fast forward, as I told, uh, told uh, Sage a few weeks ago, that I would have never thought that 44 years ago, as a young United States Marine, I'll be sitting in this position. But history came about 12 years after the death of my grandfather. And my grandfather was the one that would actually, uh, I would sit down with, uh, when I came home on leave, I would sit down with my grandfather and we will talk about who the elders were and what times were like when he was a child growing up. So in the sternal book that I had, I took a lot of notes. And like I said, 12 years after my grandfather passed away, I decided to open up that book and uh, take a look and see if I could find out who my great-great-grandfather was and to solidify my grandfather's legacy, uh, being a Titus. And once I started looking into it, and I tell people all the time, had I been uh, given the opportunity to sit and take a look at microfish all the time, none of us would be sitting here having this conversation. I wouldn't have this conversation with you because I didn't have the patience for it. So, however, uh, when I did look into what was in my book and the language that my grandfather used and the names and the dates and the places, of those uh, persons in his era. Uh, it just so happened that Mr. Ancestry.com was on commercial. <laughs> so I decided to take a look at it and I find myself going down a rabbit hole. And I've been in that rabbit hole ever since. And I came up with a whole kit and caboodle of things in my Titus lineage. And here we are today, speaking of my Titus lineage, and standing here uh, in this area, here in Greensboro, North Carolina, um, at this place where one of the persons that I was researching actually told a story of the time period after he was uh, left, after he left the base of the Allegheny Mountains being uh, held captive by some uh, British Tories 
He then walked past the Guilford Courthouse and he noticed that there were three fellas hanging from a tree that were his captives. And thus the story begins and the story continues. So history to me is that of the history of America before America was America. History to me is that of the history of my Titus lineage before America was America because the Titus family was here on these soil and on these lands. And then still yet history to me is that of the family and the Titus lineage that I found here in America scattered all across America and I've been able to find those family members dating back between 1812 and, eight, between 1812 and 1845. And also that history gave me my cousin sitting right next to me, Sage, because I never knew that she existed. And we're closer than you can ever imagine. <laughs> and here we are. And history continues. So I vow to my family that for the remaining time of my life, I dedicate myself to my community. I dedicate myself to my family to learn and know who we are, for future generations to learn and know who they are. And we'll continue to go from there. So thank you very much. And I'm proud to be here. Thank you. Thank you. So you asked the question about what did I think of history of the Patriots or African American military before this moment? Before I, you had a strong connection to this location. Yes. Have you thought much about history until that? Uh, well, I graduated from Guilford. Mm -hmm. I came here and I started to learn a lot uh, from Guilford about this area. And I would be remiss if I didn't just say, thank you for your service. Thank you for your service. And thank you for all that you do for our family. I say that because I think my role sitting here is to connect the synchronicities. And one of the synchronicities is that I walked in this park. I moved here from New York in 2004. And anything about war is just not in my book. Right. So I'm walking the park and it's a beautiful park and it was so pretty. And there were, you know, a lot of different monuments and that's, that was the extent of it. And I know Solomon's been on this journey forever and he finally said we're having our family reunion in 2020. 2019, he came to play with photo albums and all kinds of things. And finally, the light bulb went off three battles, Kings Mountain. Deep River, and go for courthouse. Duh, I've been walking in that park forever. <laughs> and I started to tell someone that. So that was one of the synchronicities. And um, the other link is I talked to you the other night about my final year in high school. Um, I graduated and I did summer stock theater in the Berkshires, which is like 52 miles outside of Williamstown. And so I think we have not only ancestors, we have ancestors. And it's got me thinking how many of us are walking in the footprints of our, our ancestors. I mean, I relocated and didn't know the connection I had. And I bet that's for most of us. So that is the time. All right, so tell us a little bit more about African Americans during the Revolutionary War. We were talking before, and not all were patriots, and there's a good reason why some some fought with the British. Some some fought with the with the British as well, uh, and then some fought with the uh, Continentals. But to start off, to start this off, uh, you got to have how religion fueled the American Revolution. <coughs> Most of us talked about taxes, searches, and seizures, but it was religion that fueled. Now, where African Americans play a huge part in that is that you take South the war starts up, up north. Washington, the, the British think they go to Boston, they would dispel the cancer. Then, when it starts to spread down north, I mean, down south, you got Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina. Why is South Carolina important? Slavery, okay? There's a huge amount of the port is used for the importation of slaves. So therefore, you want to talk about manpower. The proclamation of Lord Dunbar, he comes out and says that any African-American who decides to be loyal to the British crown, 
and gain freedom. Well, that may never come, so that starts because of the, the manpower. Now, on the continental side, Washington, he had a very difficult task. And the reason why it's the dual army, so Washington's trying to build an army in the north because the British are trying to take Canada. In the south, the British were hoping that slave owners would align with the British. So you have a substitution law which comes out in 1777. Take uh, Virginia for it, instance, tobacco. Most of those individuals, now some blacks did willfully serve, um, some were served as substitutes. And when you serve as a substitute, you're serving in your cellular master's place. Now when you get, when the war is over, you try to uh, do the state state, I'm sorry, you try to petition the state legislature to uh, secure your freedom. So the majority of African Americans who fall on both sides um, served as a potential warrior in the symbol. We got to remember that. And so they were un they were not trained, just like other whites were not trained. These are farmers. These are skilled workers, carpenters, uh, blacksmiths. Some of those serving been in the law. And so. When African Americans take hold of this, what's in their mind? Freedom. So whichever side offered them freedom, that's the side that they were more likely served with. But now the Continentals in particular, uh, Washington didn't want to make the mistake that the British made. Because the British was under the King's, king's rule, as opposed to George Washington goes to Continental Congress in his regalia and says, I want to be on the same weight lift with my men, including African Americans. So they understood that. And so, in a large part, African Americans join the ranks. You know, they're, they're being recruited because you have a regional issue in the South because of state militia, state navies, privateering, they're breaking the ship, ship. So, if Someone serves, a farmer serves after the war is going or is over, he goes back to farming. And so African Americans were critical and critical and vital at that time uh, when it came to not only substitute, but when it came to the muster rolls. And I and I think that uh, historically uh, we we must look at at that in terms of African Americans coming from each state to join the Continental Army because you have the Continental Army and then you have local militia. What's more important uh, that helps Washington out is the local militia, primarily African Americans who serve in states like, again, Georgia, South Carolina. South Carolina is rice. So, so South Carolina becomes central to this whole war. And then as the war gets up the battle, if the courthouse becomes even more, because uh, they're luring, they're luring Cornwallis and Tarleton into the grassy area. Uh, as I tell my students, we talk about battle analysis and, and terrain. Okay, so Solomon. Now, we know a lot of African American <coughs> soldiers were fighting, but their stories are hard to find for many reasons. I know at the museum, for example, we have a cap that belonged to a Revolutionary War white soldier that stayed in the family for generations. When you're talking about enslaved people, that connection is harder to get. So still, though, there are some threads. There's documents. There were ways that you were able to find out the information about Titus. So where are those records? How, how, if, how did you find out about what happened 250 years ago? Well, first, uh, it, yeah, when things set in on me, it was, it, was, it was brought to my spirit that there's no such thing as a closed book. Everything has been written. And we prepare ourselves for life and we move on with life. But when you get settled into a certain spirit, you have to move with that spirit. And in Ishmael's case, being captured, not being captured, but being uh, a, a, a fella that fought in the place of his slaveholder as a young man uh, during the Revolutionary War, 
At age 89, he decided, along with his young wife, uh, who went by the maiden name of Lucy Rogers, Lucy Rogers Titus, he decided at age 89 he would take the Commonwealth of Massachusetts to court because he fought for the American Revolution, he fought in the American Revolution, and he won his pension. So just like a few others, the pension was in fact denied. So he ended up passing away uh, in the ripe age of 108, 109 years old as a poor man and buried in Massachusetts. So in my research, when I was actually looking for the African of my great-great-grandfather, I found Titus, Ishmael Titus, along with a few other Tituses in the Massachusetts area. And I knew from the history books that that's where the Boston Tea Party took place. And, um, and, and they were in Massachusetts. So I set that information on the shelf for a bit, at least a year or so, because I didn't know uh, or had the, the, the wherewithal to take a look and in, in, in the deeper research to find out exactly what took place. And years later, I did. But then you think about Ishmael Titus himself and the stories that came out of his mouth during the time of his life in Massachusetts, Ishmael has been fighting battles in this land since he's been here. Born in the slaveholder's house of Harry Bluford, then pre-Revolutionary War, as a nine, 10 year old boy going off the battle in Braddock's defeat when General Edward Braddock went to fight against the French and the Indians, there was a 10-year-old boy that went along with the, uh, the munitions, substances, and things of that nature on the wagon trail to go fight a battle. And he survived because Braddock was defeated and his entire army was, de was decimated. So the young boy told, he lived the life, lived the story, and then as a man, he told his story. And these things came out during his time period of telling how he fought with Daniel Morgan, Daniel Green, Nathaniel Morgan, all those guys that we read about in the history books, Ishmael Titus told us those stories. And those stories have been written and documented. And as we stand here today, some things we'll never know if you don't pick up books. Everything was written. So and here it is, like I said, 44 years ago, yeah. I would have never thought that these things would be in my place. So the stories are written, the history is there. We're actually here in the battlegrounds of what of, of how things took place. And uh, it'll continue to happen and the stories will continue to unfold if we do our due diligence. And like I said, I vowed the rest of my life to make sure that all the, tour, the stories of my family and the things that they've done must and has to be told. So, like I said, I'm here to connect the synchronicities, and um, just sitting between two military men, it shows that black men have fought all the way since that time of Ishmael Titus. And that, to me, is no coincidence that they're both sitting here in between them. When I talk about um, being in the Berkshires and Stockbridge in my last year, of uh, school, working in a summer stock theater. What was amazing is it was the bicentennial summer. And it was uh, 1976, and I was so angry. I was saying, I know New York is doing America's birthday. And I'm up here in the Berkshires. But now, thinking about it, the bicentennial summer, that is just amazing. And that is where Ishmael lived in that area when he was 110, and that was the last place that he lived. So that's what I mean about walking around in the footprints of our ancestors. All of us that are sitting here, think of all the places we've been, because it's amazing how much I walked in this park and didn't really know my connection. So when I think about synchronicities as well, another reason I'm sitting here as uh, Rodney spoke of Miss uh, Joanna Winston Foley. I'm going to take the time to honor her, and I'm going to take the time to speak about, also, she was pushy, and <laughs> she insisted 
that we need. What he didn't say is she lives all the way in Berkeley, California. Mm -hmm. She's here with us. This is her third or fourth visit. She's very serious about this. Can you tell? <laughs> and so, would you take, would you stand up, please? <laughs> I didn't want to be in the panel, but I have to say the synchronicity is also because of another person here named Violet. I think Violet, is she still here? In the back. Okay, Did you? Okay, Violet. So I have to speak to why I'm sitting in this space. Violet um, came to assist me when I had car trouble in the park. I had parked it and I went to take my walk. And I went to take my walk and, and I came back and my car wouldn't start. So they said, you know, go over there and they'll help you, just, you know, ask anyone. <laughs> and I got assistance from Violet, but when we rode over, the jumper cables were in her chubby. So she was like, well, wait here and I'll go get them. I don't know who moved them. But in the conversation we had, I even put Solomon on the phone so that she could speak to him and understand, you know, the connection. So I was waiting for her, and then suddenly my car started. <laughs> so I rode back over here, and she had printed up what she had here, which was the courthouse papers that Solomon just spoke up. And so that was the like number three or four of the synchronicity. You know, the little things that you would say are coincidence, because we have this saying, when God wants to be anonymous, well, I say when the ancestors want to be anonymous, you know, you have coincidence. And when I got these letters to my job from Joanna, she just kept writing. I was like, who is writing at my job? She was sending her articles. And so we did get to talk, and then she said, I'm coming to visit. And it was Memorial Day of 2021. And we stood on this land together. And she read her article aloud. And we, you know, had our own little healing although we back then may have been on different sides because her ancestor was a slave holder. But we were on the same side because of the independence that America received in the world. And so I think that part of this space is a healing space and I just wanted to put that out there in case I didn't get to share that with you. Nearing the end, uh, although there'll be time for questions, so we can have a little bit more, but so for my final question, how has the study of history or your historical investigations changed you? You've spoken to that a little bit. And what's your advice for others starting this similar search and journey into their own past? I think uh, historiography is something that I was taught in grad school. So what I often do is study in African American history in terms of military history. Uh, I go back to, if I'm studying the American Revolution, I go back to an earlier book that was written, one Benjamin Quarles, he talks about the Negro in the American Revolution. And I look for spe specific things, for example, how were African Americans utilized? And so I go back and look at the earliest book and I go to look for a book that maybe was written, say, in the 70s or 80s and 90s. And then historiographical things change according to resources or according to primary sources. And so all of us in this room, if you have somebody who served in the military or whatever it is, that's a primary source. Uh, and so when I do my military collecting, I look at try to differentiate what's a primary source What's the secondary source? If I have a primary source, you know, I got World War II letters, and I read them and I document those things. And so, historiographically, if that information is not available, once it becomes available, it changes sort of the perspective of history because you have, that's what history is. It's different, it's multiple perspectives, you know. And so, as I tell my students all the time, you gotta look for the factual information. Okay, now Wikipedia. <laughs> and so I often find my, I'm a I'm a library rat. You know, I'm in the library looking for documents, photos, uh, because I, I want to know. It's a quest for self-discovery. And so you asked 
you know, any, if I were to give anyone an advice, just do a concerted effort on what you want to know. What are the lessons desired to tell the students? What did you? What is it that you want to know specifically? Okay, and then you you look through books, you look through photos, uh, you go to archives. They have that information, and so with that inform, you educate yourself first, and then once you get the information, then you share it. Well, history for me, it takes me, uh, again, back to, as a grown man now, takes me back to my birth. Born in integration. Uh, no, born in segregation. Raised in integration. Uh, experienced uh, the Bush and the Reagan administration. And I served my country faithfully. And I never read Mark Twain until I did read something from Mark Twain. And Mark Twain said, the two most important days of your life is one, the day that you were born, and two, the day that you found out the purpose why. And in the historical research, of where I stand now and has been standing for the past 16, almost 17 years is the purpose for my life. I understand that I served in the military. I understand that I serve currently my community. I understand that I serve currently my family. And the historical aspect of all of it is in me. It's embedded in me. It's embedded in me for my children. My young son, Kai, can you stand up for a second, please? That's my youngest, my only son, Kai Solomon. That's my only son after five daughters. <laughs> and as long as he's been on this earth, I have been on this journey. And the historical aspects of what I've learned over the years, it has to be passed down to future generations. And I tell anybody, if you decide to embark on this historical research of finding out who you are and from which you come from, you have to be diligent, you have to be patient, you have to understand that you're gonna have hills and valleys, you're gonna have to have, the, you're gonna have, to, have to understand that you're gonna come at times when you may be waking out of your sleep at night for whatever has been set into you, you're gonna to wanna to know. And there's been plenty of time before my grandma Ella passed away that I sit downstairs doing some research and I find something and I run upstairs, open my grandma's bedroom door and then realize it's four o'clock in the morning. <laughs> or I'm sitting there doing research and I realize that the sun is shining through the window. And I'm like, shucks, I've been up all night. So you have to understand what it is that you're doing and have passion and, and care for it as well. Because you're gonna learn some things that you may have never thought of, may have never thought could have happened and in my case, I've been able to find family members all across the United States. And I'm gonna keep it short and I'm gonna turn it back over to you. Um, between 1812 and 1845 is where I found the bulk of the research of my Titus lineage. That there were 12 African boys born into slavery between the years 1812 and 1845. And Sage and I come from the last branch of the 1845 Titus Africans here in America. And out of the 12 Titus boys, we've been able to find the offspring of six. And I visited those six branches of the family all across the United States of America. And then to top it off, and as they say, the cherry on top, it just so happens that when I made connections with a family in Texas, which then diverted me over to California, 
And then I get some information from a cousin who's actually a judge in California, and she says, Solomon, I'm sending something to you. And when the document came into my email, I fell over backwards again because her father, who comes from an 1812 branch of the Titus lineage, was actually, in fact, looking for us. And then I was actually able to go out to California and meet King Henry Titus for the first time on his 90th birthday. So that's the history for me. And it's been a pleasure and an honor to have had this history in my life. And I can take my rest in 40 years and I'll be fine. <laughs> so thank you very much. All right, Sage, wrap it up for us. So what I would like to say um, in all of the research for our tradition, as Africans, she keeps to hear him say Africans because I'm African born in New York City. But what I say is that the real and the storytelling and those who have the story under their tongue is extremely important for African American lineage because so much of our history was hidden. Even grave sites that do not have markers and also people migrating from the South into the city. So it's not as easy as it is for Joanna to know that Ancestor <coughs> is actually buried in the park. And it may not be his bones, but his DNA is there. So we have had Marty Mangello, who is um, a patriot expert, Al Shelby helped the family. Uh, I always I always Call Solomon and Ishmael. It's like I just the names. It's like it's in him so much. Uh, Solomon in January went to Williams College, where um, they are now helping us the African studies, and he'll be going back May eighth for at least the first phase to get um, the reporting for the first phase of their research that they've been helping us with. And so I think that is really important that we understand that. I just want to say one thing about Ishmael. Ishmael was not just a Revolutionary War hero, I mean, a Revolutionary War soldier, he was a hero. And there is a plaque for him in um, Charlotte. That plaque, it has been taken up and it's going to be uh, put back and we'll have family reunion in 2024 to rededicate that plaque. I want you to know that he was a hero because he was captured by um, the British. And when he was captured, uh, they sent him to go and find a horse that had ran away. And if you notice in the uh, illustration, where you see the black soldier, he is actually holding, a, holding onto the reins of a horse. He's on his side. And so that was what his task was. And when he went to find the horse, he ran into the Patriots. And he showed them where the British were and where they were being held, certain Patriots. So I wanted to mention that so that you know. And I also could not conclude by, um, without saying that it is really important because the black male, when we think of black males with black male bodies, they have been sacrificing ever since America became America and before America was America. They have paid their dues to this country. Thank you so much. You're all <laughs> ambassadors for the study of history and libraries. So with that, and please stay with Mark. We're going to get back to it. I'd like to introduce Arthur Erickson. He's currently our government documents librarian at the Greenfield Public Library. But until very recently, he was the genealogy librarian with the Greenfield Public Library System. He's the 2023 recipient of the Jack Duar Senior Award for from the Afro-American Historical and Genealogical Society of North Carolina Piedmont Triad Chapter Conference <laughs> for, <laughs> for his 25 years of service and support of that organization. So, thank you. All right, well, thank you. Um, 
I only have about five minutes I gather, and that is uh, not very much time to talk about genealogical research. So I'm going to limit it to sort of a description of the, the, the principles around how we built the genealogy collection downtown at the main branch of Greensboro Public Library. So the organizing principle behind it is um, that we collect primary sources, uh, will speeds, marriages, court minutes, uh, censuses, newspapers, so on, as well as secondary sources, published histories, and, as, and abstracts and indexes of primary records, as well as uh, published family histories, or unpublished family histories in many cases. Um, so we collect a wide variety of records, pretty much uh, following the, the dominant migration patterns uh, in the earlier portions of Guilford's formation. Um, and so, you know, way back, this is a little bit of an oversimplification, but that pretty much means um, the migration paths along uh, that, that the Scots-Irish, Presbyterians, German Reformed, uh, English, and other largely of Quaker persuasions, and the Africans that some of them owned, you know, where they came from. So our collection is strongest, of course, in uh, Guilford County, and uh, really the entire uh, northern Piedmont, so Guilford and all our surrounding counties. Uh, our parish counties of Orange and Rowan, which go back to about 1750. Uh, and then the places that folks came from, and to some extent, the places that they went out to. So uh, we have a pretty strong uh, Virginia collection, uh, <coughs> Pennsylvania, Maryland, Delaware, South Carolina, and a couple other spots that are more like micro uh, migration, say Nantucket Island, for example, where a lot of New Garden Quakers came from. Um, and then we also, to some extent, have a, a collection that's going outward. Uh, Tennessee, a little bit of the Deep South, um, Indiana, Ohio. So those, those outside places, uh, you can sort of dip your toe into the waters, research-wise. Um, but for Guilford County and near about, there's really no better place to do research, genealogically speaking. Uh, there really isn't any record that is available and that we know about, um, whether it's a microfilm from the State Library, uh, excuse me, the State Archive, or published books, published abstracts. If it's related to Guilford County and it's prior to about 1900, we are almost certainly going to have it. Um, if there are omissions, there can't be very many. Um, and that's not to say that we do not have post-1900 material, uh, both in original records or uh, secondary. Um, we actually have plenty, but not you know everything, everything. But prior to 1900, pretty much everything. If it's available, uh, you know, we're going to have it. Um, oh, and just to speak to that uh, serendipity, Synchronicity, I usually think of it as, as luck. Another organizing principle <laughs> behind the collection is that for Guilford County and, and our neighboring, we try to be sort of one-stop shopping. In genealogy and genealogical research, there really isn't any one institution, however large, that has everything. The Library of Congress does not have everything. Uh, the Family History Library in Salt Lake City does not have everything. Um, the State Library and Archive in North Carolina doesn't even have everything for North Carolina. And it's not that we literally have everything for Guilford, but pretty darn close to it. Um, so we're trying to, you know, part of the organizing principle is to save folks a trip to other libraries, to other states, even to the local courthouse. You know, nothing against them. But we're open on weekends, we're open at night, we have librarians. Um, So anyway, that's essentially the gist of our of our collection. You know, there's relatively little that you know that we don't have. Um, but yeah, to speak to that sort of luck serendipity angle, um, you know, in the course of really, I haven't done an enormous amount of genealogical research. I've helped a lot of people do a lot of genealogical research, and you know, very quickly it becomes clear uh, the difficulties that people of African descent uh, you know encounter 
uh, relative to, to other people. And there's a lot of reasons for that, obviously. But um, uh, we collected a lot of different areas just to sort of maximize the chances of those serendipitous events happening. Um, and really, it takes a lot of, you really just gotta push out in a lot of different directions, using a lot of different tools uh, at your disposal. Um, and just with sort of cross fingers and, uh, you know, put out a big net and harvest it in and, and see what you've got and reevaluate and throw another net out and harvest it in and see what you get. And um, I don't remember which one of you mentioned something about, um, yeah, uh, when you said something about when people start to do research, to be specific, to pick your topic. Um, and I think that's great advice. Uh, and I actually, over the years, have told many, many beginning genealogists um, to, at least when they start off, to try to be narrow, to try to be specific. You know, pick one grandparent and do that line, or pick one person and start with them and work back. <coughs> Don't do all four grandparents or all eight greats and work them all back at the same time. You're just going to drown it. And now, eventually, you know, after a couple decades of juggling this kind of stuff, people, you know, manage to, to be able to work on multiple lines all at once. Um, but yeah, I think uh, being specific in a research topic and drilling down deep and seeing what you get, and then sort of, you know, getting back in your way and taking a broad look and then going back deep and, and specific again is a very good method. Uh, but sort of simultaneously, uh, you don't really know what's out there until you look. And so I know it's sort of contradictory, but while being uh, narrow in focus, I think it's also quite useful to be very broad in that nest net that you cast. And I think a, a really helpful early step in anyone, for anyone who's doing genealogical or historical research, is just to take a minute to do the very boring and dry work of just studying what's out there at all. Uh, because the history of record keeping varies tremendously throughout time. Different records were kept, they were kept in different ways, they were handled by different people, they were maybe written down in hand and transferred to another handbook, you know, ledger, and then eventually typed up. And all these transitions start to matter. And so learning about just the, just the process of record keeping, period, will start to give you a pretty good sense of what's even possible, what's out there to be found, so that you can then go look for it. Um, hardly anybody over the course of my career has probably taken up on that advice too much because it's dry and boring, you know, work to do. Um, or they just ask me what to look for and I'll give them a pretty good idea. But, um, <laughs> Hello, everyone. My name is Beth Sheffield, and I'm on the committee that helped put to get this program together. I wanted to mention that it's also National Library Week. One uh, thing that Arthur uh, did not mention is that at the Greensboro Public Library, you can come into our buildings and use Ancestry.com as a resource. Uh, any any time of day they were open, uh, so that it's a great resource. And I also wanted to recommend to UNCG Library has a wonderful archive of of uh, court records pertaining to African Americans going all the way back. Uh, it's a great resource too, and you can connect through our library, through the park, uh, through the History Museum as well. Uh, 5,000 people of color fought in the Continental Army uh, during the Revolutionary War. It included also Native Americans uh, as well as, uh, as, as other people of color uh, as well. And also um, there were a lot of women behind the scenes. Let's not forget the women that were also behind the scenes during the Revolution War, and some that actually fought in the Revolutionary War. Uh, and so we're so excited about this collaboration and bringing hidden history together. We will allow time for Q&A. We're gonna say goodbye to our Facebook audience. Uh, we've been streaming live on Facebook the 
uh, post will be up uh, through the weekend uh, for those of you who would like to, to view this or to share it with people who could not be here tonight. And so we will say goodbye to our Facebook audience and then we will open it up and I'd like to invite both Arthur and uh, 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 Scott to come up uh, for a question and answer. Before you do question and answer, I'd like my son Josiah to just stand up. I saw your hand first. Okay, so I already have my question. Um, so I, I want to make sure you all know that there are other families that have been looking at this at this issue and for me personally it's very exciting because I was helping another family find their ancestor who fought here and uh, that there's more than one person who's even interested in that you all have brought, brought your family uh, as part of this is, is just amazing um, so I have a very specific military question which is that my understanding is that the, the soldiers from Halifax County that soldiers were put on the battlefield by county, right? So I, you could know exactly where the soldiers who are from, say, Halifax County were in the battle. And my, the way I'm understanding it is that, um, you know, when you talk about, like, the militia were kind of looked to me like cat cannon fodder. But how does how do the Halifax County Continentals fit in to the battle? I'm a woman. This is the first time I've ever cared about the battle. <laughs> this is fascinating. Because you can tell where one person was right. on a particular day. Right. So, yeah. you, well, it's never too late to, to be interested. So, yeah. thank you for that. <laughs> yeah. um, generally, the North Carolina militia were the troops out front on the first of three defensive lines, General Green position. Uh, that line was just on uh, as the come into the entrance of the park. New Garden Road, which we think runs pretty much as it did in the 18th century, bisected the line north and south. So north, as you're leaving the uh, visitor center, north would be to your right. And by and large, the militia troops from eastern part of the state were north of New Garden Road. Those from the uh, central and western part of the state, south of New Garden Road. So someone like Joseph Winston fought in the southern part of the field. Um, Ishmael Titus probably fought closer to the vicinity of the visitor center, but again, just south of New Garden Road. And for Halifax <coughs> County, the eastern part of the state, they, those troops would have been to the northern end of the road. The other thing I think to keep in mind is that that battle line extended outside the present boundaries of the park. The park today perhaps preserves a third of the original field, maybe a fourth of the original field. So you'd likely be looking at a modern uh, housing development today, unfortunately. And then just a quick reminder, all of the colonies had militia laws in the 18th century. They required adult uh, white males, generally from the ages of say 16 to 60, uh, to be on call uh, in case they were called out. Uh, by the later portions of the revolution, States like North Carolina also <coughs> use what we would call a draft uh, to require those men to serve. To serve, um, 18th century records being what they are, uh, there are large gaps in our knowledge, which is why genealogy is so important for us um, to help with those gaps. So as you as you find information, as you come across primary documents, I invite you to continue sharing those um, so that we can add the add that information to the files that we keep here. We do keep a participant file. Uh, you, know, you might also acknowledge the work that the DAR has done over many years. And one of the things that the ranger on duty at the front desk frequently does is to have a request. I have an ancestor, we think they fault here. Will you look in your participant file to see if you can find any information? I believe this saved one of your introductions. You will find that. <laughs> Just to add what Scott was saying also, because of the regional issues in North Carolina, South Carolina. North Carolina comes later to the part of the war. 
but before that you had, like you said, state militias that they were uh, bound to protect their own states. And so the line that he's talking about, you gotta remember George Washington's still up north. So he, um, so he's north, uh, sorry, Nathaniel Green is in charge of the Southern campaign. And so those states, um, this is one of the reasons why George Washington wanted an enlistment because state navies, state armies, they serve, they go back home, and now he wanted to get Congress to come up with an enlistment plan that entailed court martial, that entailed training, because these these are farmers. They they live on the countryside. They they're basically saying, well, when the war comes here, we're ready. And so that's what that's why Washington relied heavily on local militia, but I think one of the reasons that the Battle of Gifford Courthouse is not talked about is because it's not necessarily a, it's a southern state, but it the war came to South Carolina first before it came to North Carolina. Other question in the back? Yeah. Uh -huh. um, i like to say thank you also for your service. I too served, and one of the things I took great pride in, I was proud of, is that when I served, when you serve in combat, whatever unit you serve with goes on your right side and uh, that stays with you throughout your uh, career and that's your combat patch and so I serve with pride with my combat patch and so I wonder with those that we have uh, documented that have served in this battle will they recognize for their meritorious service were there any recognitions by way of medals or commemorations of any sort well um, it wasn't until now, now that this is coming to light, most of the Medal of Honors recipients are starting to be recognized now, you know, in the 1990s. With, uh, for example, Henry O. Flipper, who's the first African-American graduate from West Point. Uh, even the 92nd Division for the Italy, they're now getting Medals of Honors. Now, if you're talking about uh, the individuals, the blacks that fought in the American Revolution, Again, the problem where it becomes problematic because they weren't necessarily on the muscle roads. They used to substitute law to circumvent that. And so, unless we get this, the documentation, uh, which that's going to be hard to find, but if you do genealogical research, you'll find out a lot of African Americans served willfully. And so, the Continental, they're not, they're not a, we don't have a professional army. We have a weak government. And so when you talk about these patches and things like that, they didn't have that back then, but certainly now if you go back and try to find the documentation, certainly you can, you can find out that they served, as Sage said, they were, they were heroes, including, including the women. And um, yeah, just to add to that, um, you know, back, way back then, um, you know, while that was you know, very much a, a culture attached to to ceremony and, and pomp and so on. I don't really think of that as being an era of, you know, getting a, a, a the routine handing out of badges for different kinds of service. Um, and uh, not that this is, you know, why anyone's doing it, but I think the main recognition were things like um, bounty land grants for service or pensions and so on. Um, and if, if I'm not mistaken here either, I think Titus had th three to five different petitions, three. essentially affidavits, yeah. to, to, for demonstrating his service, which was very much questioned by where he was living at the time, which I think was Massachusetts. Yes. yes. And I think um, the final analysis, there was no one living right. who could substantiate right. But exactly. eventually, though, they, I think his, uh, at some point, eventually, uh, the combined testimony you know, had enough things that linked up um, where it did gain some kind of recognition. Recognition, but, but he never got his picture. Right, right, yeah. right. Mm -hmm. um, but enormous, I mean, I, I just reading those, uh, a summary of those petitions, um, learned a great deal about him yeah. and, and his history in the, in the, in the conflict. Yeah, so my question, Arthur is my former colleague at um, Greensboro Republic as well, and that's, that is my question about the land grants and the pensions, um, he is not the only soldier who did not get what he deserved. Yep. There's another soldier who got his pension, 
or his widow got his pension, but the, he did not receive the land grant, and I think they all knew that they were entitled to it. And I think it depends on whether you were muster or continental, and maybe that's what you're talking about with Titus, is that, um, but, and that's great because that created all, the, all those legal records, right? But again, these are these are brothers in arms. These are these people who fought together are together being denied this um, what they what they knew they deserved. So it seems to me like what Arthur was saying was think about what documents are out there. There's got to be more documents, but perhaps Titus was looking for a land grant as well. But but to send the other soldiers who fought in Dover Courthouse. That's a lot of people who would have been establishing records of what was going on in their relationship. So America 250, I remember Bicentennial as well. That was great. That's why I love history. America 250 is an opportunity to bring these soldiers, to give them that patch, the, the land grant, to give them the recognition of, of what you're talking about. So I just wanted to say that. Other questions? Saw your hand, then we'll come over here. Go ahead, man. The two of you who are from the Titus family, how did you find the descendants? Did you just use old fashioned paper trail and networking, or did you do genetic genealogy and have your DNA done, or what methodology? Actually, we're still in the, in the historical research of that process. Um, Consider Ishmael was born in 1746, and then our lineage didn't come until almost 100 years later, so 1845. Uh, we're in the process now with Williams College in Williams, Massachusetts. We just recently located a couple of areas that where his body may be uh, <coughs> located. And uh, with the help of Williams College, we're in the process of getting the genealogists and all those type of folks uh, in a position to have that body exhumed and then have it tested for DNA. Uh, we do have a couple of connections of his grandson uh, and some documents have, have come to surface about his grandson. But until we have his body exhumed and have uh, whatever remains are there to be tested, then we'll know exactly uh, if Ishmael is in fact ours. <laughs> we do know that we come from the 1812 branch of those Tituses, but he's the oldest one, he's the oldest Titus family member that we've been, been able to find. Um, and, and, and locate, so that we're still in the historical research of that process. And that area is interesting because that's the area I said that I was at that summer, um, because that area was called Williamstown, and it was where there was a lot of African Americans, and then because of the things that happened, they were pushed out. So, they were pushed out along with the Mohegan Indians, and, and now that town, then it became what we would call today gentrification. But yeah. uh, <laughs> that town, you know, or that area. So those uh, graves, luckily there are some there that have been located. We know that that was the area that they were buried in, but there are no markers. So just like with, um, what's that, the Nipple Boys, down in Florida, there was a school in which when the students looked and they were studying archaeology, they found hundreds. And somebody else said that they started looking for something. They thought they were looking for one grade, and then there were 60. So it is, um, like he said, it's a rabbit hole. I'm like so proud of him for being so diligent. My whole family, we really accept that this was his assignment, that we can see all of the dots that have been connected, that no one else could have done it. No one else would have committed and stayed the course right up until January when he was up there and sending me pictures. And now when he goes back in May, other family members will be there with him. When he went in January, you went alone, right? I uh, actually I had a few family members okay. with me, but uh, the presentation from the college has been, has been amazing at the work that the college students has done. And uh, on that same note, um, once we uh, complete that process, uh, and exhume that body, and everything comes back correct, we will be taking this pension back to court. <laughs> yeah, I'm just beginning my uh, study of uh, a lot of the African American history. And uh, one of the things I'm finding out is that there were more free African Americans uh, 
in the early part of our history than I, I had realized before. And I was wondering, for the, the soldiers who fought, the men who fought who were soldiers, they, they were given the word that, okay, you're gonna get your freedom you know, after the war is over, after we end this conflict. Were, were those commitments honored? Were, did they, is that how a lot of the African-American, free African-Americans derived uh, it, it, it says that he. It says that he got his freedom and went on his merry way. He keeps saying that no, he had to run away. I'm, I'm not. <coughs> so did they? Did they? Did they? Honor did they their freedom. Did they grant him his freedom after oh, he's done all this fight? In, a, a, a lot. A lot of. Well, go ahead. And then I'll pick you back up. With you. I can only speak in Ishmael's case. In Ishmael's case. He went into the Revolutionary War for his slaveholder, Lawrence Ross. He said he would be set free after fighting. However, so the, the owner said told the him. The owner said he would be set but free. Did the government tell him that? I don't know if the government told him, but I know the owner told him that, that he would be set free. Apparently, he was not set free because the owner was looking for him. So when the owner went looking for him, he took off out of this area and headed north. That's how he ended up in Massachusetts. Okay. While he's in Massachusetts, he's working on a farm. It just so happens that the young girl whose father or grandfather owned the farm grew up and became a journalist. And when she returned back to the area, she recognized old man type. Huh. However, she was a little girl when the slave, when someone came to the farm and said, we're looking for Mr. Titus, and he said that when he said he grabbed some, some substance and he took off and said, I'll never go back into slavery. And he took off again. So they were actually looking for him. So in my, in my perspective, he was supposed to have been set free. They went looking for him to bring him back into slavery, and he took off and never went back into slavery. And that could have happened to him and a number of others. So, Professor Hutter, you wanted to just the the, the 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 Ned Griffin in particular, the colonial government came out with the substitution law. Slave owners used the law to their advantage. They promised freedom. Ned Griffin, after the war was over with, he petitioned the state legislature here in North Carolina. It took several years for him to be free. Yes, they promised him freedom, but that that law that was set in place, they used that to their advantage. So it's probably thousands of African Americans who some willfully serve, some serve in the slave master's name. But again, if they're not on the muster rolls and they're volunteers, they're just substitutes. Now, also there were there were whites as well who served in place as substitutes. It was detailed, outlined, uh, shoemaker, uh, all the skilled jobs. They, they had to show up to, to whenever they had muster roll calls, they would show up. Now, in, in, my, in my class, ministers, when they use religion, I always like to use, they tied in religion. At these muster rolls, imagine you going to uh, Concord or Lexington in this large gathering, and you got a minister that's preaching saying, Great Britain's the enemy, this is God's, this is God's will. And because they were uneducated, most bought into that. Now, African Americans who are slaves, they don't have a choice. So there are some rebellion, but to answer your question, they just weren't, you know, the, they used the law. It, came, it became a governmental law, and then at the same time, it's defined by states and regions in the South. The states, you know, use their law, use the law to their advantage. So most of the slave owners, particularly in South Carolina, they, want to go, they didn't want to go to war. They wanted to protect their investment. But blacks willfully served and wanted to serve because they knew that at some point, freedom was going to be at the end of it. The context can also be a little helpful. Officers like Washington did not want to see black men serve in the military mm -hmm. for the very obvious reason of that revolutionary ideology, all men created equal, crossing racial boundaries. It was late in the war that southern states raising continental troops, Virginia, for example, 
uh, required a black man to show to either be free or to show freedom papers. Mm -hmm. So we know of an enlisted man who fought in the Maryland line here named Isaac Brown from Charles City County, Virginia. And he's described as a free man of color. Uh, he was not enslaved, he was a farmer. And that allowed him entry into the service. Um, our, our favorite story, of course, is Ned Griffin, uh, eastern part of North Carolina. The bargain he struck was with his master, William Kitchen, who bought Ned Griffin from a man, uh, an enslaver named Griffin, so there's where Ned got his last name, bought him for the specific purpose of having him substitute uh, in the army. William Kitchen was uh, arrested for desertion and his punishment was to return to the Continental Line. So this was a private deal between the enslaver William Kitchen and Ned Griffin. You serve and survive, I'll grant you your freedom. Uh, Griffin did, but of course when he returned home, uh, William Kitchen had a memory lapse. Uh, but the promise was well enough known in the community that uh, petition was uh, organized uh, with Ned Griffin leading, leading the way. He signed the petition with an X, so we don't think he was uh, literate that way. And that went to the General Assembly, which was then the High Court of Appeal in North Carolina, which granted him his freedom because of that promise that had been made. But by and large, there was no guarantee that if you served, you would be given freedom at the end of the war. That's what made Governor Dunmore's proclamation in Virginia right at the very beginning of the war so dangerous, so threatening, and one of the things that caused white Southerners to so much <laughs> resent what the British were doing. Uh, Lord Dunmore, just before he abandons the capital of Williamsburg, uh, offered, actually, actually, after, offers any enslaved men who leave their plantations and join British forces that they will be given their freedom. That's a promise that the British have a hard time keeping, but we think it did cause a lot of a lot of black people to leave their plantations and was something that must have must have been widely known among enslaved population. At the uh, siege of Yorktown, remember at the end of the at the end of the Southern Campaign, Cornwallis moved to the Virginia port of Yorktown. He had with him a train of runaway slaves who were enlisted in the British Army that were usually doing support work, dirty work behind the lines. When the siege tightened around Cornwallis and smallpox broke out, Cornwallis's response was to turn out all of the runaway slaves who had followed him, essentially drove them out of his entrenched position into no man's land toward the American lines, uh, which allowed a lot of those, uh, a lot of those uh, people to be captured and claimed back as slaves. We have time for one more question. Yeah. Um, yeah. Looking back into your own family's past, um, have any of you thought about now, currently in the present, preserving stories of your current family for future generations? Everything's being documented, yes. Everything. He has a whole room. <laughs> a whole wall filled with, yes. And my son is here, and his son is here. And um, as I said, it's like storytelling is a part of the African tradition because we realized we couldn't always rely on written word and new <coughs> construct because it's a fabricated construct. A lot of the social constructs are fabricated, right? Especially as it relates to our connectedness. And so stories and passing them down is all that we really have. That's all we have. And, and you have an ally in the National Park Service. The Thank National so Park much. Service is intended to be America's story keepers, right? And it makes me think of the value of place. So I started this evening talking about the theme for National Park Week of your park history. The power of place makes me pivot. And I, I think I'm able to use my position to, to change the theme to this of this National Park Week to the park story, right? So I, I leave it there. Thank you all very much. A round of applause, please. For the
I think one of the things that works so well is that Ben mentioned that this is National Library Week. <laughs> the theme of National Library Week is there's more to the story. So I think that that's what we realized this evening. The question that came, what are you preserving for your family and for your kids? I think that they has to always be that we know that regardless of what we may know in the moment, that there's always more to the story. So with the commitment of the park system, the library, you know, the History Museum in Greensboro, in Guilford County, we are here to help you find your more to the story. Thank you all to our guests. I'm going to do this again because I'm, I'm, I'm the boss of her, I guess. Beth. Beth. Thank you. Thank you. Beth, when I say, when I say, when I say, one of the things we do try to do at the library is we try to recognize the fact that the work doesn't get done by the administrators. The work gets done by the people or that the boots on the ground bring the great ideas to us, and we just have to find a way to make it happen. So make sure it's a way out to Beth, to Aaron, and the rest of the committee, as well as the panel. Just tell them thank you for what they do for your county. Have a good evening. Thank you.